share um, in continuation of the series we've been in called Running with the Giants. And it's this idea that uh, what would it look like if we got a giant out of scripture, some of these heroes of the faith, if you will. And uh, we, we too can be one of those heroes for a, a, a new generation one day, but we're looking to scripture and we're, um, and we're seeing what scripture says in Hebrews 12. And let me read it to you. Ch- chapter 12, verse one says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything, say everything. everything. By the way, the Greek word for everything is everything. <laughs> Throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, that's true, and let us run, how? With perseverance, the race marked out for us. So we've been looking, as the Bible says, there's a grandstand of heaven. And if you've ever been around crowd noise, you can hear, the, you can hear them saying something, you can hear the noise, but you can't really decipher what they're saying. So the idea with this series is that we would pull one of those crowd noise individuals out and ask them to run a lap of life with us. And what would they tell us now that they're on the other side? So we're all in our race, but we can look to Bible characters who have finished their race and learn from the challenges they had so we don't have to go through the same challenges. We can just stand in the victory that they showcased us in the scripture. Say amen right there. So we're doing that. Today's giant. We did a little poll on social media. Some of y'all didn't play, but some of y'all did. Most of y'all thought it was Moses, but you were wrong. Today's giant is Rebecca with a K. Rebecca with, you know, Rebecca with a K is spicy. That's that spicy Rebecca, but she's awesome. And she's a Bible character. Some of you are like, oh man, uh, who's that? I'm going to tell you in just a moment, but she covers a topic and I think demonstrates something that's prevalent in scripture from cover to cover from the first book to the last book, Genesis to Revelation, she really downloads a topic that we see throughout scripture. Now, I'm a, I'm a numbers guy, or I, I think I'm a numbers guy. If I'm anything, I'm a numbers guy, okay? It's, I don't do a lot well, but I can, I can see that area of life, okay? And I spent a, about nine years as a financial planner before God called me to vocational ministry. And, and through that, I not only read the Bible, you know, just reading it, but I look for patterns. I look for the frequency of what's said, how it's said, and the order in which it's said, kind of all that kind of flow. I know I got some buddies back here that do that same kind of thing in life. And, and so this, if I were to give you some statistics, this topic is 15% of the gospels. So like almost one out of every five words in the gospels is around this. Of course, if I were to preach this at the frequency the Bible talks about it, about every fifth Sunday, come on, we just had one of those fifth Sundays, we would be talking about this topic. Actually, Jesus touched on it more than heaven and, heaven, heaven and hell combined. And it's this idea of generosity. There's no amens ever. When you, everybody's like, all right, get the kids, I'll get the car. You know, he's, he's going the generosity route. No, 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 just open your heart to God and listen as we study the life of Rebecca. And I think God will really help us all today. But here's what would Rebecca would say, give generously to others. Like if you're gonna invest your life in anything, invest it in the only thing that shows up in heaven. And that's eyeballs, everybody. Invest your life into people with your words of encouragement and your handwritten notes and your hugs and your high fives and your pearly whites. Like do everything you can, use your home, use your car, use your resources, use your time, use your gifts, use your talent, invest your life, give generously to others is the mandate Rebecca would say to us. But let me set up the story because it starts with who would become her father-in-law, Father Abraham. Anybody remember Father Abraham? So in Sunday school, we used to sing this song, Father Abraham. And if you're new to church, uh, let me embarrass myself. It would go like, Father Abraham. You somehow hit the robot while you're doing this. Had many sons, and now it should be the Dougie or something. But that's what you did then. But Father Abraham was known as the father of faith, and he had a promise from God. God gave him a promise and said, I'm going to make you as numerous as the stars. I'm going to put a blessing on you, bro. You ain't even going to be able to contain it. But Abraham starts aging. And how many know when there's a, there's a gap between the promise of God and the reality of that promise, we start thinking God forgot. And Abraham was human, even though he was this man of faith. And so he became concerned, like all of us parents do. Any helicopter parents out there? It's careful, don't admit it. We'll, we're going to pray for you at the altar afterwards. No, we're not really. We will, though. We will. If you, 
But, but so Abraham was like, I got to take matters into my own hand. He became concerned because he knew the promise wasn't only going to be fulfilled in him, but oftentimes God uses generations and our legacy and a group of people. That's why we're the family of God on a mission for God, advancing the kingdom of God. That's why we're the flock of God's pasture, the body of Christ, because when God goes to use you, he always groups you. And at, Abraham knew this. And so he started stepping in, but he was concerned because Isaac was his only son. Isaac was his only child, and he's like, my boy's good looking, you know, like dad, but, but he ain't got no wife. And I know how, how reproduction happens, and so I got to take matters into my own hand and find this brother a wife, which I kind of like that. That's the Old Testament model. I kind of want to bring that back now that I have three kids and a daughter. I kind of want to bring that s- spouse selection back. Like, honey, I'll, I'll choose your spouse. I'll propose to him for you and let you know. <laughs> And she's like, that, that's not going to happen. And I'm like, okay, well, yes, it is. So Abraham does this. This was the model. He's like, I'm going to go find a wife. And he gets his chief servant. The Bible says his chief, Genesis 24, you can pick up the story. And he, and he, and he gets his guy and his main guy who oversees kind of his household. <clears throat> He's kind of his manager, his, his number two or his number one guy, whatever you want to say, his right hand. And he brings him and he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out and find Isaac a wife. And he, he leaves a lot of autonomy there, but he does clarify it within some parameters. He said, you got a lot of autonomy, you know, figure it out how you want to, but I need you to keep it within the family because we ain't trying to have no pagan women up in here. Come on. We don't want that unevenly yoked. You need to come on, young people. You need to be matched with someone who's pursuing God like you. One person said, if you want the right spouse, run hard after God and just look to your right or left and see who's running with you. Come on, parents. I I set you up for an amen right there. (laughs) If you got students, Lord, help us all. We're trying to get them, uh, keep them holy and get them married. And and so so he's trying to get his son. He gives him some parameters. And he, and he, he leaves and the servant takes a bunch of stuff because he doesn't know what he'll need on the journey or even when he gets there. And he also takes 10 camels. And so we pick that story up in Genesis 24. And it opens with this. I love this. It says, then he prayed. Come on, how many know prayer is good? Uh, but he prayed because he was so nervous. He was like, I don't want to let my master down. I don't, man, I'm going to botch this. And how many know we can bring our nervousness and our anxiety and our fear to the place of prayer? We don't have to hide those things as if they don't exist. God welcomes that. Okay, so I love that, that the right response, even in a hard situation, was prayer. He, he used a faith moment and he said, then he prayed, oh, Lord. How many oh Lord prayers out there today? You know what I'm saying? That's that desperate, like, oh Lord, what have I done? What have they done? What are we going to do? So this was a desperate moment. And he said, oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink and I'll water your camels too. Let there be, let her be the one you have chosen for your servant, Isaac. And by this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Now this was a big request, but I know that God honors bold prayers because bold prayers honor God. Like, let's don't be a church that prays for something that we can see how it's going to work out with our own strength, right? I want to pray prayers that if God doesn't show up, I don't know how it's going to work out. And I know everybody in this room brought that type of prayer with you, whether you pray it or not, because we're in life. And like the chief servant, we got some things before us and in front of us that are, are hard and difficult, and we got to figure out how to work them out. But the next verse says this, before he had finished praying, oh, I love answers before I'm even done praying. Rebecca came out with a jar on her shoulder. Shout out Harbor Freight, one of our sponsors. Not really. (laughs) She had a jar on her shoulder. She was probably like, if you like it, then you should have put a ring. Probably, she probably wasn't like that, but she's just like doing her thing in the obscurity of where God had placed her in the unseen. She's just using a jar to do what is asked of her and and her daily chores. And it was probably mundane, but she's just using what God is doing in her life. And I believe we can learn from her because the Bible says that the man of God took 10 camels with him. So when she committed to do a generous act for that chief servant, she said, not only will I give you a drink, but I'll water your camels too. How many know she went above and beyond? 
She didn't have a spirit of entitlement with, I'm going to do the least I have to do. No, she was like, I'm willing, ready, and able. What do you need? I'm not only going to meet your need, but like God who does exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask, think, or imagine, I'm the type of person that wants to exceed your expectation. That is good. And she was living a generous life. Now, look at this. I want to put it on the screen, trying to numerically kind of come up with this. Ten camels. Any zoologists in the room? Probably not. But, but you will read that. <laughs> yes. Why would a zoologist be here? They're at the zoo. Um, <laughs> but we have a zoo, so let's find out who the zoologist is and get them in church. But ten camels at the end of a day can drink, some say up to 30, but conservatively, I just put, they can drink 20 gallons of water. So when she said yes to this commitment, <laughs> I don't know if she was a, was a professional in camelology, but what she said yes to was that I'm going to have to come up with 20 gallons of water to honor this need that's been asked of me, which 200 gallons with a five gallon bucket was 40 trips, assuming conservatively to scoop it out and to carry it probably uphill because you know that's when you do something for God, it's never downhill, right? He always lets you come up the hill because he's forging uh, just a strength and a character in you. But 40 trips to honor that one request that she may have thought nobody's ever going to see. I'm filling up all these buckets, making all these trips to feed camels I don't even own for a man I just met, and I don't even know what's in it for me. How many times do we only do things that are generous when we know there's something in it for me? We live this life of, of give to get instead of biblical generosity of give to give. It's a the words of Jesus, it's more blessed to give than receive. But through this one act, we see that Rebecca's act of generosity changed the world. And I love, 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 love her attitude because it is in stark contrast to the attitude of the world we see today. That we have the attitude of minimalism and the least I can do. And, and this heart that says, look, I, I don't know if I want to even help others. I got a list of needs on my own, but the Bible tells us that her generosity marked her before the man of God. And I want to speak to somebody who's doing things in the unseen. You're doing things that have been asked of you and you're going above and beyond and you've got a willing spirit and you're not just meeting expectations. You're trying to exceed them. That is not out of God's sight. He sees you and it's marking you and he's going to send a man or woman of God to pull you out of that obscurity and to promote you to a place of significance. If you will only stay in that spirit of generosity as Rebecca did. I want to tell some young people that you need to marry people and look for people that ain't just fine. And that's good. But they need to also have some character. They need to also see how they serve people. How, how do they serve in the house of God? How do they honor their parents? How do they uh, live their life and posture their lives? Not when everybody's watching, but when no one's watching. We can learn a lot from Rebecca's life. I love in this text that the Bible says she accepted the proposal before she ever saw Isaac. So this chief servant just rolled up with some jewelry and she's like, oh, yes, yes. The, the answer is yes. Come on, husband, write that down. You know, she says yes to jewelry. But I, I love that because she ain't even seen that brother and because there was a gift brought to her and much hasn't changed. The women like jewelry and the men like work. Come on, girl, what you, can you work? And she's like, yeah, you got some bling? Great, let's marry. It's great. That's what the scripture tells us in this scenario. But I think every giant, not just Rebecca, would tell us this truth that life is short. James actually said, your life is a vapor. It's here today, gone tomorrow. And it's okay to have stuff. God is not opposed to you having stuff as long as you know the stuff's not going to last. The only thing that lasts are you and I and each other. And may we, like Rebecca, posture ourselves and position our lives that we don't just invest in temporal things or we don't just invest when we get something out of it, but we will lay down our life for the love of a brother and a sister. And we will give generously to others as Rebecca modeled. I want to give you a few principles out of her life based on this heart of generosity. And the first is generosity is opportunistic, not legalistic. It's so funny when, as a pastor, you know, some of the questions you'll get is, do I have to tithe? Like, I love Jesus. Do I have to give? And I'm like, I don't know if that's the right question because it's not a have to. It's a, it's a get to. 
that the old covenant was, it was obligation. You had to fulfill the law, but giving was even before the law. And so Jesus, when he came, he took what was outside and obligatory and he put it on the inside of you that you would have both the desire and power being made in his image and likeness to be a generous person, not only with your money, but with your time and talent, because God is looking for the willingness. Second Corinthians actually says that if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable. And the Bible tells us that generosity is opportunistic, not legalistic. But it's so funny because people are like, am I, am I going to be cursed if I don't tithe? No, no, no. Look at me. Look at me. God does not curse you. Jesus broke the curse. Okay. Can you say amen right there? That's your amen moment. I know this isn't a sermon that has a lot of amens. That's your amen moment. Jesus broke the curse. And I'm not here to put the guilt on you. My job as a pastor is to get the guilt off of you. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, but we should have a willingness to be generous above and beyond everything that God has done for us and given us for the benefit of others because we don't do it to others, we do it to God. That's why 2 Corinthians says, each man should give. So we all should give what he has decided to give. So it's not between you and a church or you and a pastor, but generosity is something we should all step into because the Bible says, just don't do it reluctantly. Don't be like, oh, I got to give or Jesus is mad at me. <laughs> and even don't do it just if I'm compelling today. The Bible says, don't do it because of that. That's right. For God loves a willing spirit, a cheerful giver. That's why one of our core values, we have seven of them. They're on our website is generosity, our joy. Last week, we talked about God opposes the proud. We don't want to be anything that God opposes, but the Bible says God loves. We want to be everything that God loves. And here it says God loves a cheerful giver. And watch this, 2 Corinthians, the next verse says, and God is able to bless you abundantly, which I can speak to the parents here because you treat your kids the same way. If you have a stingy kid, come on, we all got to help them, whose first word is either dad, dad, or mine, 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 mine. We're all born to like hoard and hold back. But if you have this stingy kid who's always wanting and never giving, and then you have another kid that just wants to bless everybody, what do you do as a parent? How much easier is it to bless them and let it flow through them? God's not only your God, he's a father, he's a parent. And in the same way, he can, oh, that's how, oh, that's how you're gonna use your house? Boom, bless him. Oh, oh, so you're going to use every sphere of influence I put you in to bring people to, oh, okay, that's a blessing. God's going to put favor on your life. That's what the scripture said, but we got to take off this legality of giving and step into the opportunity. It's an opportunity and a blessing to give. Number two, start with what you have. It's so easy to live in this one day win mentality. One day when I have a bigger house, I'll host a city group. One day, one day when I get a little extra time on Sunday, I'll worship one, serve one. One, one day when, when I hit the lottery, don't tell us, okay? But when you hit the lottery, I'm going to give. And Jesus comes along with a different concept and says, whoever can be trusted with little can be trusted with much. But whoever is dishonest with little, they're not going to do it when they get more. You don't change when you get more. It probably gets worse. And that's why statistically, the most wealthy people are a lot of times the least generous because that spirit of materialism sets in and we we become controlled by it. And that's why Jesus wants us to live in a generosity type of life because it breaks the spirit of materialism. He doesn't need your money. He has cattle on a thousand hills. He has the streets of gold, but he wants your heart. And he knows a lot of times your heart is where your money is. And he knows what you treasure, your heart will follow. And so God is teaching us to start with what you have. Rebecca had a bucket. What do you have? Moses had a staff. What do you have? Can you play the guitar? Can you rock a baby? Can, Can you park a car? Can you park a person? Can you help someone learn how to read their Bible? You've been given a gift. In the New Testament, we're all priests, not just a guy on a stage on Sunday with a microphone. Like God has said, you are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus in advance to do good works. You have a calling and a purpose on your life. And I would even say this in love, not to hurt your feelings. You will never live a fulfilled life if you never step into your God-given purpose. There's a part of you that will never be fulfilled fully when you don't do the thing and use what you have. And Rebecca would tell us that. Thirdly, she would say, make eternal investments. I see, I got some buddies in the, the numbers guys and 
And I know they track things and it's good to have a budget. Come on. I mean, trust God, but also get a financial planner. Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, just use every tool at your disposal to get yourself healthy because a lot of times God's people aren't stingy. They're strapped. And so they just, they want to be generous, but they don't know how. And so you need a plan in that area, but we're to live our life for the life to come. The Bible says we're foreigners passing through this life. It's a vapor. It's here today, gone tomorrow. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. Have you? (laughs) One pastor said, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. Which reminds me of this uh, joke I heard. Matt, you you guys want a joke? Can I lighten the mood a little bit? So there was this uh, man, and undoubtedly he was a Scrooge, and but he was a great businessman. So he had multiple businesses. He had, that, he had that old money. You know what I'm saying? He's still living on money from 20 years ago, that old money. He ain't even spending new money. And so he just had so much money, but he was stingy and he was a Scrooge. And so in his will, he said, I want all my money buried with me. Put all my possessions in the casket. And so you can imagine the family members who thought they were going to get a cut, you know, they're like, yo, they're uncle so-and-so uh, because they love that money. And so you can imagine their fallout. Well, the story goes at the graveside, they end up burying them. And then so many are just, what happened? What happened? They approach the widow and said, did you, did, did you fulfill his, did you do what he asked in his will? And she said, absolutely. I'm a woman of honor. They're like, oh my, why did you do that? And how'd you make it fit? She said, I wrote him a check. <laughs> huh, that's funny. That's funny. I don't care what you say, but make eternal investments. Did Rebecca know the weight and the brevity of her one act of righteousness? I don't know. But because of that one act of righteousness, she became the great, 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 grandmother of Jesus. So from her one act of obedience with a willing spirit, she may have not saw the sowing and reaping principle in her life. But God had a sovereign plan and a weave he was webbing together as his people will just respond and obey and do what seems illogical and irrational, but is commanded in scripture. If we'll just come with a willing and obedient heart, God's weaving a story and a plan that's not just based on your generation, but it is generational. And now we have the Lord Jesus came from her lineage because she was living her life, making eternal investments. And that's why Jesus says, do not store up for yourself. Treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store it for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Jesus is giving us the insider trading tip of all insider trading tips. And he is saying it's okay to have stuff as long as you know your stuff's not going to last. So don't put your eggs all in that basket, as we used to say in the financial world. You need to invest into eternity. You need to invest into others. You need to invest your gifts and talents into a place where God can get glory. It can help a lot of people and you can find the fulfillment you're looking everywhere for. Talking about Garth Brooks, looking for love in all the wrong. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. And that's what we do with our lives. We go around trying to find fulfillment in things that will never fulfill us. And only God will. Culture's focus for us, you see it in commercials and in life, culture's focus is to raise our standard of living. But God wants your focus to be, how can I raise my standard of giving? Number four, lead with decisions, not feelings. Feelings are real, but they're not necessarily right. Your feelings will lie to you. Can I get a witness to anybody? Has anybody ever followed their feelings right into some bondage. (laughs) This guy, right? Your feelings are real, but they're not necessarily right. And they're definitely not a good leader of your life. And so we need to make a decision, settle it. Like I'm asking you as a Christian. And if you're a part of this church, settle the decision, make a pre-decision that I'm not waiting for a burden or a feeling. I am going to live a generous life because I'm made in the image of Christ and in his image and likeness, I too want to be generous and I'm going to be a blessing to every person God allows me to be. One person said, I just don't feel led. Well, brother, get the lead out. Let's go, baby. (laughs) We just wait for these emotions and they're real. Your emotions are not bad, but they are not good decision makers for your life. And that's why we spend our life living this verse in reverse. The Bible says in Matthew 6, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. 
We let our heart lead. Where my heart is, I'll do my stuff. Wherever my heart is. And we lead this life like tossed by the waves, like James says. We don't know where we're going because we're so emotionally led. And the Bible's saying, come on, settle some decisions. You got to put some things to rest and step into this calling to live this Rebecca type of life. Amen, everybody? I want to give you three things before she goes back into the grandstands of heaven. I think she would tell us those principles. Hey, life's short. Life's a vapor. Position yourself that you can get as many people into heaven as you can through what God has given you. Make it an opportunity, not a legalistic approach. Keep your heart in the right place and start with what you have. Do everything you can to make eternal investments and definitely understand the truth that our decisions lead and our feelings follow. These last three I wanna give it to you in a couple of minutes and then we'll pray together. And the first thing Rebecca would say before she goes back in the grandstands of heaven, I think, is never forget small acts make a big difference. Like today, when you go to eat and you have a great meal with your family or friends and you get below average performance from the waiter or waitress, tip them big anyway. What if that single mother is at her third job? Wonder if that struggling father has already ran Uber Eats, done everything they can through Monday and Friday, and they're dropping balls because they're fatigued and they're exhausted. And that like Rebecca, you could be the answer to a prayer of someone that's needing an answer. You could take an action in one step of kindness, not based on their performance, because God doesn't treat you based on your performance, but based on being a blessing, you just bless them indeed and point them to Jesus. What would it look like if every day of every week, a few hundred people in this community of Wesley Chapel and surrounding areas live their life to make the lives of those around them better, starting with what they have, using what they have to make a difference in others' lives. I'm telling you, it would flip the city upside down and these rooms, you couldn't do enough services because people are drawn to generosity. People, it would blow their minds and they would say, I know you and why are you treating me this way? And the Bible says, if anyone gives even a cup of cold water, she, she filled some camels, seemingly small. A small act makes a big difference. And Jesus rewards those types of people. Jesus is a rewarder. Not everybody gets a trophy. Now, salvation is free. There's two judgments at the end of your Bible. You need to know these. You're going to be asked two questions. The first gets you into heaven. Only Jesus saves. The question is, what did you do with my son? You want to get that right. And I want you to get that right. And so your first answer is, I made him my Lord and my Savior. And I followed him and I surrendered my life to him. Come on in. But the second judgment in Revelation is a reward judgment. Jesus is a rewarder, and I like rewards, and you should too. It's aplodidomai in the Greek, but one act can create a big difference. Number two, generosity creates legacy. The only thing that outlives you is what you do for others. The person you develop and disciple and invest in, the kids in your home, when they are driving you crazy, Can you still invest in them and realize the greatest investments that we make in our life are not necessarily portfolios and in stuff and all that's fine. It is in people. Rebecca would say, invest your life in people. And lastly, I want us to know that our giving is to the Lord. Like you're not doing this to a church. You're not doing this for a pastor. When you give, you give to God who in His very nature, Christ, gave himself to us. God is a giver. And he's generous. For God so loved the world. And we're called to live in his image and live out his likeness. So this is something we can step into as a church. I'll end with this verse and we'll pray. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. You didn't do it for Palm City. You didn't do it because you felt obligated or thought you were going to be cursed. When you do acts of generosity, you're doing it to the Lord. Amen, church? Let's pray. God, we thank you today for your word. And God, we stand in this moment with open hearts. And we're asking you to put a spirit of generosity on us. God, help us to take the next step to be more generous than we've ever been with our lives in every way. 
The word says on every occasion. God, give us occasions and we'll make a promise to be generous. Thank you for those who are holding babies right now because they're not doing it for you. They're doing it for a church, not for a church. They're doing it for you. Thank you for those who got here at 615 to set up a room. They're not doing it for a church. They're doing it for you. Thank you for those who parked cars and helped people check in their kids and are giving out information, serving coffee. Every small act of kindness makes a big difference. So God, we bless them in Jesus' name. We bless them in Jesus' name. If you're here today and you need to give your life to Christ, you're like, PB, man, I, you know, I, I, don't know if I, can, I don't know if I'm in a relationship with God. This is your moment. This is your next step. So you can't do those other things until God changes your nature. And he does that when you put your faith in Christ. The Bible says you're a new creation. So God doesn't come along and try to make you an improved version of an old you. The Bible said God makes you brand new. And some of you are in this room and you need to be made brand new by the love and the forgiveness of Christ. And I'm not going to play games, but I want you to take a step of faith today and very quickly raise that hand if that's you. Say, hey, count me in this prayer. Maybe I made that decision long ago, but it's been a while and I've walked away and I'm ready to give my life fully to God. You don't even have to understand everything that's on the other side of that obedience because God's looking for a willingness. And he will help you with your understanding and your grace and your relationships along the way. He's helping me. Nobody arrives this side of heaven. We're all on a journey. But you can start that spiritual journey today. Yeah, it's awesome. Slip it up, slip it right back down. I want us to pray this out loud for those who are making this decision to honor them and give them some privacy. But if you're meaning this today, I want you to say this. Come on, everybody out loud. Jesus, thank you for your generosity. Thank you that you loved me more than you loved you. Today, I ask you for forgiveness. Be my Lord and Savior. And I commit to following you the rest of my life. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. Come on, let's put our hands together. Great job. Great job.